Okay, so we are in the middle of, of, of Ezekiel. We're in the middle of, of hopefully some good news. Uh, now, all of it's good news. I need to stop. All of Ezekiel is good news. Some of it is a little bit more uh, dreary, and, and it makes us kind of like, do we have to listen to that again? And, and right now, we're in the part of these oracles of restoration, and yet... What you'll see today is that in the midst of these oracles of restoration and hope, he still brings in these contrasting oracles of destruction uh, to kind of weigh them together so that we see the preferable future of where we want to be and where we want to go against the unpreferable future that is a reality should we choose to go another way. And today is, is no different. And before we jump into that, I think we need to watch some old family movies. How many of you have old family movies at home? Old family movies. All of you have a, You don't have old family movies? Who didn't love their children? No, I mean, yeah, right? So you have old, My father and mother, they would set up a camcorder on Christmas Day and let that thing run for three hours. We have... Years of three hours of Christmas history that should we ever decide to sit and watch, we could. But why do you watch old family movies? Not to torture your relatives in any way, shape, or form, but it's to look back and to see the personalities of, of the family and the memories. And, and, and as you think of, your, of yourselves now as adults, or maybe your, your aunts and uncles that you watch, you can kind of begin to see the origins of why they are the way they are, just by how they act and react. I go back to old family movies, I see myself, and I look at my son and think, you got it honest, kid. And that's exactly true. We watch these old family memories to kind of remember Let's go through some old family movies of the Old Testament, of our ancestors in the Old Testament, beginning with the family movie of the Abrahamic Covenant. Now, you're going to be thinking, why is he doing this? Because all of this is foundational to what Ezekiel is going to say today. And so we put up the slide projector. We look at the family movie of the Abrahamic Covenant. Who is Abraham? God selects and calls Abraham. If we were to watch the movie, we'd see him call Abraham, and God just kind of say to him, go from this land to the next And Abraham does it. Why? We don't know. Just that he is faithful and he is obedient. He listens, he takes his family, and he moves. And God credits this faithfulness, this obedience to him as righteousness. Man, you are are a man of pure and good heart. And then we flip through the next slide and we see God kind of double down with, with Abraham and get, it, get a little bit more of what this means that he's this, uh, in this relationship with, with God. And so God sets up through Abraham this covenant that through his descendants the, they will be numerous as the stars and that they will, God will give his descendants through Abraham a promised land, a place for them. And then we flip the slide and we see Abe's kind of challenge to this because this all seems very far-fetched and he wonders and even asks God, how? How are you going to do this? How are you going to have descendants through me? I'm old and my wife Sarah is old. We're in our 90s. We're not thinking it's time for babies and we couldn't. Sarah couldn't. So how's this going to happen? And so what we see is God do a couple of tests for Abraham, two that I will call out. One is uh, a dream. Abraham gets kind of put to sleep a little bit, and God gives him a sign act in a dream to answer the question, how will I know you will be faithful unto this promise? And in that dream, God kind of sets up this agreement with him through a sign act. Now, you all are familiar with sign acts. If you've gone through Ezekiel, it's a demonstration of sorts. And God, in this demonstration, he shows up as this fiery pot, and he passes through broken pieces of animals in the dream, to say that if anyone should break this covenant, they will become like these animals. Now, typically, this is a ritual done through humans in covenant making. And the one who walks through the broken animals, that's the one that's pledging the oath that should I break the covenant, make me like these broken animals. But in the sign act with Abraham, it's not Abraham who's walking through those animals but God himself. How will I know you will be faithful, Abe asks. God says, I'll show you how to be faithful. I will take on the penalty of your imperfection of keeping this agreement, of this covenant agreement between us both. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. It's one of the most powerful parts of Scripture. If you ever get a chance to read it, Genesis 15, get your minds around it, of God demonstrating that you're going to be imperfect in this, Abe, 
and I got it all under control. But that wasn't it. There was another slide, another test. Abraham eventually has a son, a son by the means of which God told. Isaac, right? And then what does God say to Abraham about Isaac? What does he tell him to do? This son that's been promised, he tells Abraham to do what? Sacrifice him. Kill him. Well, that seems odd. How will I know that you will be faithful, right? And so Abraham, as we've seen in old family movies, very obedient, very faithful, takes Isaac up to the mountain, says to his servants, wait here, we will return. We will be back. Another little sign of Abraham's Blind obedience and faithfulness. Doesn't know how they're going to return back, but here, here we go. Gets up to the mountain, sets him on the altar, gets ready to kill him, and what happens? God stays his hand, says, no, no, no. Okay, good. Thank, thank you. You're faithful. You're obedient. And then God provides the means of salvation. Don't miss that. That's not just because Abraham was faithful. God provides the means of salvation because through Isaac the descendants and offspring are supposed to come. And so it's not because Abraham was faithful and going to kill him, and God said, no, okay, just kidding, and your faithfulness is good, and that's wonderful. The trajectory of the covenant comes by God's act of salvation, by providing the ram. That is by design, so that Abraham himself cannot boast and say, it was because of my faithfulness that we could have these descendants. It was, it was because of what God was doing through them. What a great family movie. What a great family movie to hear about Abraham and his obedience and how we're getting to where we're at. So now we got Isaac, right? Let's look at his family videos. So now we got Isaac, and Isaac marries this woman named Rebecca, and he is the person in whom the descendants are supposed to come, and they have uh, relations, and she is now with child, not child, children. So good on them, right? Way to, way to knock two birds with one stone. Now they've got twins going on, right? And so they're trying to fill this mandate of multiplying and numerous descendants. God says to Rebecca, so hey, you've got two nations in your womb there. And one of them, the older, is going to serve the younger. Now that's odd. Because it goes against all human tradition at the time. Hear the specific of what I just said. It goes against all human tradition of the time. The human tradition of the time is that the firstborn son is the one who is the patriarch in waiting, who is the heir apparent, who gets all the, the glory and all the inheritance. That's the firstborn son. So even in the situation of twins, the one who is coming out first, just by dumb luck, is going to be the firstborn son to receive that inheritance. But God says, not this time. No, the younger one is going to be the one who gets that blessing. And the older one is going to be called to serve the younger one in this way. And God always does this. God always picks the least likely until who? Jesus, the firstborn and only son. All human firstborn sons tend to get passed over. Why? Because the firstborn, if it's human tradition that they get all the inheritance, they think it's owed to them. They think that that is a given that they get it just because of their birthright. And God says, not today, not by my plan. And Paul even tells us in Romans that the reason why God did it this way of saying the older will serve the younger is so that by his design and his sovereignty, the continuation of election, of grace, of his descendants would be by his hand and not by human means. So now the result of this action is centuries of bad blood between Jacob and Esau and the nations that they represent. Jacob goes on to represent Israel, God's chosen people, God's chosen nation, and his brother Esau, who, don't forget, was a part of the family line but could not keep up his end of what God was saying, what was going to do, and therefore is outside that covenant, and he represents the nation of Edom. Everyone say Edom. Edom. Yeah. Very good. 
One receives the election of grace, the children of the covenant, that's Israel. The other, the election of destruction, not able to accept the terms outside the covenant. But here's the rub, my friends, and keep this in your hat today. The sinful personality that I'm saying that comes from Esau and Edom, Jacob had as well. Jacob had as well because what Jacob did was he tried to trick his father into getting Esau's blessing. Instead of trusting in the Lord of what the Lord said over Rebekah, Jacob tries to maneuver it by his own hands to receive that blessing. Both of them are sinful, so what's different? Something supernatural has to happen in order for God's chosen people to receive the promises that he laid out with Abraham. Numerous descendants and a land that is yours, and I will be your God. Ezekiel's in the part of the oracles of restoration. That's where we're at today. Last week, we got the good news of the restoration of the Davidic covenant, the good shepherd, the sprout from the stump of Jesse, the foretelling of the coming of Christ. And today, we get the prophecy of the restoration now of the land, set up with Abraham, further described through Moses, the blessings and the curses, see Saul, if you follow, you're blessed, if you disobey, you're cursed, now all come to a restoration in this prophecy of permanent possession of the land. So something has changed, something has to happen. And we learn today that God means what he says when he says throughout the whole Old Testament, I am your God and you shall be my people. This promise is from the Lord and it is an unbreakable promise. When God says you are my people, this is a claim that is unbreakable. And my friends, that is good news to hear today. All of us in this room, before we even go on to the history of everything that's here in the Scriptures. Remember and cherish the unbreakable status of being called God's people. That no matter what you do, no matter what sinfulness may befall you and that you may engage in, if your heart is gripped and grasped for the Lord and you follow Him and believe in Him and have faith in Him, you are set free from the bondage and the destruction that sin leads to because you are His people, and that is unbreakable. No schemes of man can ever pluck you from His hand. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's the good news. In fact, we, as my, my joke is, we can shut this all down and go to lunch because that's basically what we're going to hear today. Okay, so let's dive in now, all right? So let's look and see. Let's pull this apart here of you are my people and this is an unbreakable claim. Remember, as I said in the beginning, Ezekiel's habit has been holding up two different things so that we can see them. See them in tension. Uh, it's called juxtaposition. Put them together so you can compare and contrast. Today we're going to look at chapter 35 and chapter 36. Chapter 35 is the unpreferable future. Chapter 35 is what we don't want to be, but yet it is a reality, and so we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about what this reality is of what it looks like to not be God's people and, and the characteristics that come from that, and maybe even see a little bit of yourselves as God's people and what they have done to know and hope of what is the preferable future in chapter 36. That if he says, you are my people, he means it. And even though you may sin like Edom did, there's a covering over you that can't be taken away. So let's look at tablet one. What does it mean to not be his people. Once again, Ezekiel compares and contrasts, like I said, these two things. So let's dive in here. Let's look at chapter 35, verses 1 through 15. The pages are up there on there. If you want to open up your Bibles, you can look at it on your phones. But here we go. Let's see what this unpreferable thing is. Chapter 35, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir. Okay, real quick. Mount Seir is the mountain in which Edom is a part of. And now what you need to see is, if you remember, let's review, if you remember in the beginning of Ezekiel, there was prophecies against the mountains of Israel, if you remember. And now as we get into this restoration stuff, Ezekiel is told to prophesy against 
these other mountains. And Mount Sair is the, is the mountain in which Edom is kind of founded, which means that God's going after even a more personal enemy. Because remember, Edom is in brotherhood with Israel. They are founded with Esau, who's the brother of Jacob. They should not be in this bloodthirsty rivalry, but here we are. In fact, what you'll see here is God is going to talk about blood, as if to say there is bad blood, centuries of bad blood between these two nations. If you're a medical person and you do a blood transfusion and you give the wrong blood to somebody, I had to Google this, so doctors in here, tell me if I'm wrong. I Googled. I Googled. I'm looking over here, doctors. I see you back there. You give a wrong blood, you get the wrong blood. Oh, there's another doctor back there, so I'm watching you too. You give the wrong blood, the host blood begins to attack that, and that, that there actually could be fatal results because of those things. Here you have these two blood relatives, yet there's bad blood. And when they get mixed, there is destruction and there's inevitable death unless something supernatural happens. So he is told, son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against you. Ooh, this is a bad place to be. And I will make you a desolation and waste. I will lay your cities waste, and you shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I want you to pay attention to repetitive phrases. Verse 5, because you cherished perpetual enmity and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment, therefore I live, declares the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you. Because you did not hate bloodshed, therefore blood shall pursue you. I will make Mount Seir a waste, a desolation, and I will cut off from it all who come and go. And I will fill its mountains with the slain. On your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines, those slain with the sword shall fall. I will make you a perpetual desolation, and your cities shall not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord." Because you said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and will take possession of them, although the Lord was there, therefore as I live, declares the Lord, I will deal with you according to the anger and envy that you showed because of your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And goes on to say that, they have, they have magnified themselves against God. They, they defamed him with their mouth, even though they think that he didn't hear it. And God says, but I heard it. And then as the whole earth rejoices, God says, I'm going to make you desolate. And you will know that I am the Lord. Okay, repetition of phrases. Which ones? Which ones stick out? then you will know that I am the Lord, right? That's big. That one's said several times in there. Another one that's kind of hidden is the comparison of perpetual enmity against Israel and perpetual desolation. To say that if you're going to be always against God, you're going to be always in desolation, a perpetual desolation, right? This oracle describes what it means to not be God's people. Edom is the nation that comes from the patriarch Esau, as I said, and they have rejected the family line. And the characteristics that we get from this passage is this, that they prey upon the weak. What you may not have heard in that passage is that God is recounting for Edom that when Israel was down for the count, they rejoiced. And not only did they rejoice, they helped the other nations do it. And not only did they help the other nations do it, but when they were completely just out and about, they thought it was their right, Edom, to take over Israel's land as spoils of the war. And God says, you did this thinking that I wasn't there. And you said these things thinking that I didn't hear it. But this is a big mistake. You see, the non-elect always think that the capital G God of the world, the one who created the heavens and earth, the one and only true God, 
is a lowercase g God. That's the problem at the core. See, Edom thinks that the patriarch of Israel, the patriarch God, is gone. He's left them. He couldn't preserve them. He couldn't have protected them. And therefore, that God, that lowercase g, whomever they're worshiping, is not real. And not only that, that even if he was real, the blessings that God is promising is only for Israel. So why should we follow him in any way, shape, or form? The bigger mistake in there is thinking that just because God says they're going to be blessed, it doesn't mean that the judgment for the world is only for his people. You see, if you have the mindset that God is a lowercase g God, you think you are absolved from all the expectations, the judgment, and anything that comes from it. You think you are just living your best life and you are free from any of those consequences. And in so doing, you make the mistake that God is not the almighty, sovereign Lord that he is, who created the heavens and earth, all of it, and therefore is Lord over all of it, regardless if you're his people or not. Being claimed as God's people, being claimed as God's people, gives us the covering of the Abrahamic covenant, the security, the protection, the preservation over the equality of his wrath and judgment for all. We all fall short, we'll be judged, but we or his people have an unbreakable promise that says we will be preserved, not because of our merit and how good we are, but because of God's grace. Edom never fully grasps this. And in their hubris, they drastically underestimate God, who was their God as well, but now they're outside the covenant. They are not my people. And they will receive the judgment that we all will receive, but without the covering. And that is a bad, bad place to be. The commentator that I read, Daniel Block, says this, The ultimate goal of the Lord was not the destruction of Mount Seir, though that was an inevitable outcome, but that they would recognize the patron defender of Israel is also the Lord of their own history. See, the non-elect think that they're outside of everything that we believe of God, and they're going to be sorely mistaken when they all come for judgment. All of us receiving that same judgment, but those who are called my people in God's care get the covering and get the preservation and get the grace, and those that don't get the perpetual desolation. This is a bit of a fire and brimstone, right? Yeah? But it's true. I can't stand on anything but the truth of what Scripture says. When God makes the claim over us all that we are his people, my friends, that's unbreakable. That is unbreakable. Because remember, Israel is not just this squeaky clean nation, is it? No, we went through the whole prophecy of Ezekiel, of him laying that down, that they are not the squeaky clean nation. That, that they thought everything was owed to them as God's chosen people. And then when everything went to pot, they demanded that God show up after centuries of never following him. And so what God does in departing from the land and departing from the temple, he says, this is what happens when you act like the Edomites. Let me show you. But Edom made the fatal mistake in thinking that God, in letting this judgment happen, was no longer there. And that pretty much just underestimates the God in whom we have. God does this by his hand and his design to bring about the education and the understanding that his grace is by his heart and by his design. It's not by anything that we can merit or mount up on our own, and it's not something that we can lose either. Those whom he has chosen are his called people of grace. And then what does that look like? That's the second tablet, chapter 36. So in chapter 36, we get the preferable future, verses 8 through 15. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall set, shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am for you. See the compare and contrast. I'm against you, Mount Seir. Israel, I am for you. And I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply people on you and the whole house of Israel, all of it. 
The cities shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. And I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times and will do more good to you than ever before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will let people walk on you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess you and shall be their inheritance, and you shall no longer bereave them of children. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you that you devour the people and you bereave the nation of children, therefore you won't do that anymore. And verse 15, I will not let you hear any more the reproach of nations, and you shall no longer bear the disgrace of the peoples, no longer cause your nation to stumble, declares the Lord God. This is the preferable future. Do you see that now what it means for God to be for you? And you're right to have your ears perk up to all of the creation stuff here, the multiplication, the fruitfulness, and everything like that. God is restoring the already promised land for his people. But my friends, what's different? We went through the whole Old Testament. This is not the first time land has been given or promised to be given to God's people. And what we see throughout the Old Testament, I said this last or two weeks ago, that the land is always a temperature of the spiritual health of God's people. If they are unhealthy, the land's gone. It's cursed. It's, it's standing against them. No multiplication, no fruitfulness, just bleh. But if they're for the Lord and following Him, everything's great. The land's for you. So now we get this prophecy here from Ezekiel who says the land's going to be back to you. And you're going to permanently have it. And it's going to be better than it was before. What changed? Or what has to change? And this is what it means to be in the unbreakable covenant of God. What changes is what Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel 34. The good shepherd, the Davidic line, the Messiah who is to come. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and being broken and having his blood spilled out and having all of those things happen so that we would not have the punishment of sin and receive the covering of that, we cannot be removed from this land. The difference between Eden in Genesis and this Eden that Ezekiel is talking about that's supposed to be better than what it formerly was is that it can't be lost anymore. The Eden of Genesis had the tree and the option for humans to reject. And now what Ezekiel is saying through Christ, through the Davidic heir, all of these promises that God has set out in motion are now permanent. And nothing can take those away. And therefore, you are a part of the unbreakable bond of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for us, but for Ezekiel is talking of the one true God. And nothing can pluck you away. The other nation, Edom, the non-elect, who all hope is not lost for them. There are passages in the Old Testament that say that, they, that even Edom can receive the ingrafting back in. And we know this too of Jesus, right? In John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Even the branch that is falling can be grafted back in. But for those who just won't, for those who are in total opposition an enmity, perpetual enmity against the Lord. What waits for them is perpetual desolation, which is also unbreakable. And so, my friends, you are the people of God. You are saved and covered by Jesus Christ, the Davidic heir, the good shepherd. So live as those people, knowing the truth that nothing can separate you or take you away from the love and the claim that God has upon your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, I thank you for your many blessings. And sometimes it's hard, Lord, to swim in these historical family videos of what you did and said and are doing, what you did with the Old Testament people through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, on through David, 
through all of the people that are there, Lord, it is hard sometimes to get our minds around what you're doing. And yet oftentimes in scriptures, Lord, you call us to, to not try so hard to do that, but just be the recipients of your blessing, of your anointing, of your claim upon our lives. And having so received such a claim, to then walk as you walked, to live as you lived, and to share that good news with others until the day comes when the new heavens and new earth arrive. So Lord, let us live as new heavens and new earth people, sharing the good news of what it means to be claimed by the God Most High. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, my friends, my friends, those who call upon the name Jesus Christ, you do so because of his call upon your life. You are called and claimed as people of the God Most High. And therefore, what awaits you in the future is a land and a place and a status that is permanent and unbreakable. And so, as people of that unbreakable bond, leave here today with great assurance of faith and courage to share the truth of that with others so that they too can join this wonderful, unbreakable family. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Stay dry, everybody.